Well, it's 730, so I guess we'll get going here. Get up my notes here. All right. So welcome uh, to uh, What's Up in February. This is a presentation of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Edmonton Centre. And uh, let me share the screen here. Bring up, there we go. Okay. Um, the original intent of this uh, session was to have it at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Planetarium when it reopened. Uh, it was scheduled to open in June of last year, but of course, uh, uh, the pandemic has uh, delayed everything. So these sessions were going to be held in the QEP. They would have been live in front of you know, real people instead of uh, online. Uh, we call it What's Up for Edmonton because uh, some of the uh, information in um, various publications, what you hear in the media, don't really apply to us at our northern latitude. They're more, even in the, uh, the handbook I found, especially this month, uh, some of the stuff in the handbook didn't apply to Edmonton. It applied more to uh, southern latitudes, uh, say Toronto. Um, and I'll get to that later on. Uh, most of the information I do use does come out of the RASC's Observer's Handbook. It's a, it's a great resource. It comes out every year, goes to um, every uh, paid up member of the RASC, or you can purchase it from the RASC uh, uh, shop uh, online. So what's up? Uh, in the sky in February. Uh, I call it winter sky delights, but we wary of the weather. I understand this week it's going to get quite cold, but uh, last time I looked, it was still clear out. So um, we've got uh, Jupiter and Saturn emerging from solar conjunction, and, but very difficult to see from our location. In fact, I would say uh, almost impossible to see from our location during the month of February. We're going to have to wait until uh, later on into March before we can see them. Uh, the one planet that is still easy to see is Mars, which uh, was uh, closest to the Earth in October. It was very bright. It's still up there. It's still fairly bright, but it is fading. But it's uh, still up there in the early evening sky. Um, Mercury pops by very, very low in the early morning at the end of the month, but it's a really tough target. Um, and uh, Orion the Hunter, the uh, great constellation of the winter, uh, rules the night sky. Um, and I'll talk about Orion a little bit more next month. So I'm going to stop this share and then bring up my planetarium program. Okay, uh, this is a program called Starry Night, which I use. And I've got it set uh, for the coordinates of my backyard. And I've set it for 7.30 for tomorrow night. Uh, I didn't see much sense of putting it for tonight because you're all in here watching this right now. So um, in the evening sky, um, as I said, we have Mars uh, dominant, uh, just starting to uh, uh, go into uh, Taurus and then Uranus, which you would need either uh, a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope to see is not that far away. Uh, Neptune is uh, just about to set at 7.30 tomorrow. You've got the traditional winter constellations, which uh, have many bright stars. You've got Taurus the Bull here with its bright star Aldebaran. You have the uh, open cluster, uh, the Pleiades, uh, just uh, above it. Uh, there is also a number of other uh, deep sky objects within uh, Taurus, and uh, if you get a, uh, a, a sky guide, you can uh, look them up. Um, got Gemini with his two bright stars, uh, Castor and Pollux. Uh, you have the brightest star in the sky uh, down here, Sirius, which is part of uh, uh, Canis Major, the great, uh, great dog, which is Orion's 
hunting um, uh, companion. Uh, this one, uh, Sirius, um, it's kind of an interesting star. Uh, it's it's very bright because it's 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 a white star and it's quite close to Earth. It's about eight eight and a half light years from here. But because it lies so low in the sky from our latitude, it's shining through a great amount of atmosphere and it appears to twinkle quite violently and change colors. And it's been mistaken um, many times for a UFO because, because it, if the atmosphere is very unsteady, it, it almost looks like something you find in a disco, discotheque or something like that. Now over uh, further to the east, We've got uh, Leo starting to uh, show up. Um, one of the reasons they say uh, March comes in like a lion is because at the beginning of March, Leo is just uh, fully above the horizon at the beginning of March. And of course, if we look into the northern sky, we see our friend uh, Ursa Major. Uh, the Big Dipper is part of that. Follow the two pointer stars to Polaris, uh, the North Star. Um, from the city, inside the city, the only stars I can see, naked eye, are Polaris and then these two guys at the end of the bowl. Uh, I have to go out of town uh, to see the rest of the constellation. Uh, the Little Dipper, also known as Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. If we go further to the west, uh, we see our old friend from the fall, Pegasus, uh, the upside down flying horse. There's his head, there's his legs, there's his body. And Cygnus, uh, the swan, which um, contains the bright star Deneb. And uh, lower down you see uh, the very bright star Vega, which is part of the constellation Lyra. Uh, these two stars plus a third one, uh, Altair, which is down here somewhere below the horizon, make up what we call a summer triangle. Now let's go, if you want to stay up a little bit later, we'll go to, let's go to 10.30 and see what we got here. So 10.30, uh, we got uh, the great dog fully above the horizon. Uh, Leo is uh, well above the horizon. Uh, Butes uh, with its bright star Arcturus is starting to make an appearance. Arcturus is, um, can be seen most of the year, but there uh, for a few months, it does set below the horizon from our uh, from our uh, latitude. But uh, Arcturus is a fairly bright star. It's a, it's kind of a friend uh, to me because there's so many things you can uh, uh, find just using Arcturus as a starting point. Uh, and of course, if you want to find Arcturus, if you're not sure, it's kind of it's got a reddish color. You, you look for the Big Dipper and follow the uh, Big Dipper's handle, this arc of the Big Dipper, which arcs down to Arcturus. Okay, and Mars is uh, getting ready to set. So if we go into the morning sky, so it's gonna get bright here. I'm gonna make it, uh, let's go 5.30 in the morning. 5.30 in the morning, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we have, uh, uh, the uh, waning uh, moon. We see the uh, some of the constellations of. Well, let me get back to the south again here. There we go. Okay, uh, some of the uh, constellations of the summer, um, like uh, Virgo, uh, which in a couple months will be in the evening sky and it's a great place to look for galaxies. There's a uh, dozens and dozens of galaxies in the within the boundaries of the constellation Virgo. Um, we got uh, Libra the scales, you see Scorpio starting to point uh, poke up above the horizon in the early morning sky. Now one thing you're not going to see are any planets right now so I'm going to advance I've got this message here right in front of my control panel. Uh, I'm going to advance by the day. And as we go through the month, here, here comes the moon around. We're into March. 
And as you can see, at 5.30 in the morning, uh, there are no planets. Now, if I advance the time a little bit, so the sun is starting to come out, you can just see Saturn is just right on the horizon at 6.30 in the morning. Um, let's go 59. And there's Mercury. Saturn is washed out by the uh, the rising sun because the sun is almost is right behind there. If I uh, advance it to uh, well, go 7:15, you can see the sun coming up. Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn's lost in the glare. So not a whole lot to see is for if if you're looking for planets uh, this month in February. Uh, there are some are. are some, also, there are no meteor showers, and uh, there's no uh, uh, bright comets to speak of this month either. So that's about it for the planetarium section. Alice, did you have anything to add? Ah, uh, you're muted. Um, no. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. As you said, it's it's a very quiet month. So uh, good for uh, um, deep sky observing, if as long as the uh, temperatures rise up. Uh, but also just a good time uh, in <coughs> excuse me <coughs> in the uh, in the evening just to step outside, have a look at the stars, and learn some of their names. Just five minutes at a time. Right. And Alistair also does his uh, uh, learn the uh, night sky uh, a week before I do uh, during the month. And uh, if you go through a whole year of it, you'll have enough knowledge to uh, apply for a certificate uh, from the RASC. Okay, let's continue on. Okay, tomorrow, uh, February 4th is uh, third quarter uh, moon or last quarter sometimes referred to. The moon is new on February 11th and uh, the day after marks uh, the beginning of the lunar new year. So uh, let's see if I can say this right, Qin Yin Kui Lu uh, for uh, my Chinese friends. Uh, first quarter is on February the 19th. And the moon is full on February 27th, right near the end of the month. And it is known in some circles as the snow moon. It's also known as the hunger moon uh, due to the scarcity of uh, stuff to eat and also the storm moon uh, because of uh, the kind of weather we get in February it can either be really bad or really good. So uh, my moon feature that I picked this month uh, and I'm picking uh, uh, features that are in the RASC Explore the Moon with Binoculars uh, program, certificate program, are these three guys in this uh, photograph of mine. Um, uh, triple craters. So I'm just going to zoom in on my picture here. I'm afraid it's not a great picture, but hey, what are you going to do? Okay, so uh, these three craters are uh, best seen uh, around first quarter, so this month around the 18th and 19th. They are Ptolemaeus, which is this big guy here, Ptolemaeus, named after the second century uh, Greek astronomer Ptolemy, um, is 153 kilometers in diameter. Uh, Ptolemy uh, mapped the stars, mapped the sky very accurately. Uh, however, he was uh, uh, the lead proponent of uh, of a geocentric uh, solar system with the Earth at its center, and and that uh, model of the solar system. Uh, held sway uh, well into the Renaissance. Uh, the next one is uh, Alphonsus. It's 109, 
119 kilometers in diameter. It was named after a 13th century astronomer. And it's that guy right there. And the bottom one is um, Arza shell uh, right there. As you can see in my bad picture, it has a prominent central peak. Actually, Alphonsus also has a central peak there. There's the two central peaks. Um, it's a 97 kilometer uh, diameter uh, crater, and it is uh, named after an 11th century, 11th century astronomer. Now, you may be wondering about this guy over here, and that crater is uh, Albategnus, Albategnus uh, 136 kilometers, 10th century astronomer uh, it was named after. But I picked these three because they're all in a row, um, and here's a better picture. Uh, you can see that uh, Ptolemaeus is uh, got a fairly flat surface. There is that one prominent crater in this, off to the side there, uh, and its walls have been eroded over time. These are these these are in the highlands, and they are billions of years old. Uh, these two craters are a little bit newer. Uh, Ptolemaeus looks to be the oldest of the uh, three craters. Anyway, they make an interesting target. Um, easily seen in binoculars, uh, very easily seen in a telescope. Um, so if you're looking at the moon around first quarter, check it out. Uh, they are going to be right near the Terminator, right along the uh, line between uh, light and darkness. Okay, uh, the constellation that I picked uh, is, uh, I was going to do Taurus, but uh, Alistair did that last week, so. <laughs> Uh, talking about the Pleiades and stuff. So I'm going to do Cancer uh, because it has two, uh, two nice clusters in it. Uh, cancer the Crab, it's uh, part of the Zodiac. And uh, the two clusters are M67, uh, the King Cobra cluster, and then M44, uh, the Beehive cluster. The M stands for Messier, uh, Charles Messier who was an 18th century French astronomer who cataloged 110 objects um, that kind of looked like comets. Uh, he was a comet hunter. So whenever we would find something fuzzy in the sky uh, that did not move, because comets of course move, uh, he would catalog it, give it a number. So uh, the beehive was the 44th item he uh, cataloged, M67, the King Cobra cluster was the 67th. Uh, the first item he cataloged was actually the Crab Nebula, which uh, I'll talk about here uh, one of these days. Now, one of the things about cancer is I must not have a very good imagination because I don't see a crab there. But apparently some people do. I don't know. Anyway, let's go on to the clusters here. Uh, this is a star map of uh, the cluster with the boundaries of Cancer. There's M44 and M67. Talk about M67 first. Um, the uh, King Cobra cluster. It's um, excuse me. It's very old for an open cluster. Open clusters generally last, you know, tens to hundreds of million years old. Uh, but then, and when and then the stars just gradually drift apart. I'm sure that our own sun was born in a cluster, uh, you know, several billion years ago and uh, just drifted apart because stars are born in, in, uh, in a nebula, cloud of dust um, and gas. Uh, multiple stars are born in these nebulas and they just kind of drift apart. But uh, M67 is pretty old. It's uh, they estimate it's between three and a half and five billion years old, which is really, really old for a cluster. It's about um, uh, 3,000 light years from here. It's very tough to see in binoculars. It would just be a little tiny snudge, and you'd have to be in a very dark spot space to see it. You'd need a telescope to get a very a, a good view of it. Now, on the other hand, uh, M44, the Beehive, is uh, easily seen uh, with a small telescope in the city and even a good pair of binoculars out in the country, uh, away from city lights, you can see it with a naked eye as a tiny little smudge. Uh, it contains um, hundreds of stars. It's about 610 light years away. 
Um, it also has a name, uh, Percipi, which is Latin for manger. I don't know why. It doesn't look like a manger to me, but anyway, uh, again, I lack imagination. Um, it's a frequent target. I, uh, I like looking at it. I've even tried photographing it uh, with limited success. It kind of looks like a cluster. So yeah. anyway, one of the things about M44 is it lies very close to the ecliptic, which is the, uh, the line uh, which the uh, moon, sun and planets uh, travel in, in in the night sky. So it is frequently visited over uh, over the decades by planets and the moon passing either very near or even right through uh, the cluster. And here I've got a picture of the beehive and the planet Mars just passing by saying hello. Okay. So other highlights this month. Um, Venus is very low uh before sunrise almost impossible to view from edmonton and as i pointed out in the planetarium section same goes for um, jupiter saturn and mercury um i will say that uh the handbook does say that mercury is putting on its uh best morning appearance in the southern hemisphere so it isn't just it, it depends on where you are on the planet uh, uh to see uh see the planets <laughs> Uh, the first two weeks are a good time to observe in the evening. There's no moon. Uh, the sun is still setting relatively early. Uh, if only the uh, temperature was a little bit uh, warmer. I was talking to Alistair before this session and he said he was going to run out after this for maybe 10 minutes and test a, test a new piece of equipment he's got. Uh, so hopefully the weather will improve um, and uh, you guys can go out and uh, do some observing. Have a look. And Mars is going to have company uh, starting on February the 9th. Uh, there are currently three spacecraft heading to Mars. Um, the first one is from the United Arab Emirates. It's the first uh, interplanetary probe, uh, AMAL, which means HOPE, and it's going to go into orbit, hopefully, on the 9th. Uh, on the 10th, uh, the Chinese uh, Taiwan 1 will go into orbit around Mars and it's carrying a lander slash rover combination. Uh, like I said, it will go into orbit on February the 10th, everything going according to plan, and uh, they will attempt to land the uh, lander slash rover combo uh, sometime in May. And then February 18th, uh, NASA's uh, Perseverance uh, with the Ingenuity uh, helicopter on board are going to land on Mars. Uh, that is a certainty whether it lands in one piece or several depends on if uh, the braking uh, maneuver goes as uh, according to plan. It's going to use a similar, well, an identical landing uh, technique as uh, uh, the Endurance Lander did uh, a few years back with the uh, rockets and sky crane and such. Okay, now we come to the, it happened this month in space. So I've got two items uh, to talk about. One uh, was a first and one, um, if you've watched uh, my sessions before, I always have a little bit of a hook uh, um, leading into what I really want to talk about. And uh, the hook for the second one is one is a very thin hook. I, I'll, I'll admit it right now. Nope. Oh, okay. So, uh, first item. When I was a kid, I watched a lot of movies and TV. Uh, there were a lot of TV westerns, and uh, one of the dangers that um, constantly uh, uh, came about uh, threatening the cowboys um, was quicksand. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a, an old Western TV show with that, but I did find a major movie uh, directed by David Lean, which kind of gets to my point here.
Okay, so what does quicksand have to do with uh, space, uh, events in space? Well, prior to the uh, moon landings, uh, some people speculated that perhaps the moon was coated with um, thick, thick, thick layers of dust, uh, hundreds of feet deep that would swallow up a spacecraft uh, if it tried to land. And I think this thinking came from the way people look at dust here on Earth, which floats in the air and gently uh, alights down onto the ground and, and uh, builds up. Uh, now, of course, on the moon, without any air for the dust to float in, it's uh, any pieces of dust. And there's a lot of dust that hits the moon. It's not gently settling down on the surface. It's plowing into the surface at several kilometers a second. Uh, so it is going to uh, compress. It's going to melt. Um, and it's not going to build up into a thick layer of dust. So uh, 55 years ago today, uh, the Soviet space probe Luna, Li Luna 9 made the very first uh, soft landing on the moon. Uh, Luna 9 was launched on the uh, 31st of January. And as I say, it landed uh, 55 years ago today. It carried uh, two instruments, a, um, a camera and a radiation detector. Now. This is the, uh, the whole vehicle that, that went to the moon, but actually uh, the part that uh, had all the equipment was this little bit right at the top. The rest of this uh, was, was just almost like the bus. Uh, it had all the rockets and uh, navigation equipment to get to the moon. But once it got to the moon, it was only this little part here that survived. And I've got a little video here that showed how it worked. So we make mid-course corrections uh, directed by Earth. It would turn around, start a braking uh, maneuver. And as it got close to the uh, surface of the moon, it would eject this top piece at the top. And it was uh, cushioned by airbags. And the airbags would um, be deployed and four pedals would open up and the craft uh, would uh, transmit its uh, pictures. The fact that uh, they got pictures from the surface indicated that no, there was no deep uh, quicksand like uh, uh, piles of dust for the spacecraft to sink into. So uh, there's a, a drawing of Lunar 9 on the uh, lunar surface. Now, I have a few pictures here. Now, funny thing about um, uh, these photographs, the radio signals uh, going back uh, to the receiving stations in the Soviet Union uh, were also picked up by uh, the Drogrel Bank Radio Telescope in the UK, which at the time was the largest stereo steerable radio telescope in the world. And um, the, the, uh, the simple radio signals were uh, the same type of signal that were used to transmit photographs uh, um, for, for newspapers and such. So it was not the Soviets that released these pictures first, it was the Brits. Um, so you could say that uh, Pravda got scooped by the uh, Daily Express. Uh, oh, those Russians. Uh, it was a battery powered uh, spacecraft uh, and it ceased operations on February the 6th. Now, the second thing I'm going to talk about, and this is the really narrow hook, is this. August 1st, 1981. <laughs> okay. You're probably wondering, well, what, what's that about? Obviously, that's a, a, a montage of uh, Apollo uh, images, uh, and it's in August, not February. So let's just look at that first one. Pay attention to the very first image. That one there. So I'll stop that. 
That image came from uh, the flight of Apollo 14, which landed on the moon on February 5th, 1971. Uh, the three crew members were Alan Shepard, this guy here. He was the very first American in space, flew on Freedom 7 on May 5th, 1961. Um, he was going to uh, fly the first Gemini mission, but he was diagnosed with uh, Meniere's disease, which is an inner ear condition, uh, which caused uh, very violent vertigo. Uh, and he was actually grounded from flying uh, for many years. Um, he had an operation in the 60s, which installed a, a tube in his ear to balance the fluid in his inner ear, and he was cleared to uh, fly again. Uh, Ed Mitchell, this fellow here, uh, he was the lunar module pilot. I actually met this guy. I have his autograph picture hanging on the wall over there. And then Stuart Rusa, who was the command module pilot. Apollo, um, Apollo 13, uh, of course, uh, followed uh, the near disastrous flight of Apollo 13, uh, which had an oxygen tank explode and uh, knock out uh, uh, most of the critical systems. And had uh, they not had a lunar module attached uh, to the command module at the time, they would have died uh, within hours. Uh, the spacecraft was heavily modified. Um, uh, they put a third, uh, there's, without getting into too much detail, uh, the Apollo spacecraft carried double of everything. Uh, just about everything had, had redundancy built into the Apollo systems. So they had two oxygen tanks, they had two hydrogen tanks, they had three fuel cells. Um, when the oxygen tank uh, exploded on 13, um, it also damaged the manifold feeding uh, the second oxygen tank. So all the oxygen leaked out into space. And uh, because it uses fuel cells, uh, which uses oxygen and hydrogen to create, uh, to generate electricity, uh, within hours, the spacecraft uh, was pretty much dead. So what they did, they installed a third oxygen tank and a 400 amp hour battery uh, in a different location in the, in the service module. They also improved uh, manifolds. They improved the wire insulation, which was uh, one of the causes of the explosion. Um, and uh, they had Apollo 14 basically fly the same mission as Apollo 13 was going to, which was to go to the Framora Formation in the Lunar Highlands. It was the first Apollo uh, flight to go to the Highlands. The other two, um, Apollo 11 and 12, landed on uh, in Mara. Um, they thought that uh, ejecta from the Imbrium Basin impact uh, would be there. Uh, part of the uh, uh, mission plan was to uh, trek up to the rim of Cone Crater, which was uh, a deep impact crater uh, near where they landed, uh, which promised samples from deeper layers of the moon. Uh, the launch was delayed by weather for 40 minutes um, because of weather. Uh, oh, I just said that. Um, on the way to the moon, they had problems with docking with the lunar module. Uh, the, um, the capture latches on the probe of the command module didn't work properly. Uh, they eventually uh, got it figured out and, and, and docked. Uh, during, uh, after the lunar module separated from the command module to begin its landing, uh, but before they fired the engine, the abort switch, uh, which was a switch they would push if they needed to abort in a hurry, was acting up because there was a loose piece of solder inside the switch. And if it made contact while the engine was firing, uh, the mission would abort automatically. So they had to uh, have a computer software set, uh, uh, routine set up and they had to punch it in manually on their, uh, on their disky computer uh, to lock out that switch. And then uh, in the final stage before landing, the landing radar wouldn't lock on, uh, but they fixed that by uh, cycling the circuit breaker and uh, got the landing radar to go. So that's a brief description. So I have a few photos. Now, when they landed, um, uh, they, they landed the uh, lunar module Antares right here. They landed on a bit of a slope. You can see it's actually tilted, uh, but they landed uh, only about 175 uh, feet away from uh, the intended landing site. Um, their trek up Cone Crater, which is right back there, uh, would occur on the second EVA. 
Now the uh, regolith at this landing site was uh, quite a bit deeper than uh, the uh, regolith at Apollo 11 and 12. Uh, you can see how far the leg dug into the soil uh, when it landed. The, the, uh, the dust was, was pretty thick, not enough, of course, to swallow the spacecraft. Now I like this picture uh, just because the moon is just uh, gray and the sky is black. It's total lack of color except for the flag and then uh, the astronauts themselves. Uh, if you don't know, um, after Apollo 12, um, they started putting these red stripes on the commander's spacesuit so they could tell which one was what. Uh, on Apollo 12, neither of them had identifying stripes. And when they were looking at pictures after they got back to Earth, they couldn't remember who, who was who, <laughs> unless they could, unless they were very close to uh, the subject in which case on the uh, chest pack, their names were on it. But um, so they, they started adding these red stripes. But I, I just like this picture because in a, in, a, in, a, in a place with hardly any color at all, there's some color. Uh, they deployed uh, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, which was a, a nuclear powered science station, which functioned until 1977 uh, when it was shut down, uh, mostly because of budget cuts. And uh, as I said, it landed in the highlands. The terrain was uh, a lot more hilly uh, uh, where 14 came down uh, rather than uh, 11 and 12, which was pretty flat. Now I've got a couple of videos here and it relates to that MTV clip. So what happened? Uh, the, uh, the astronaut coming down the ladder in the MTV clip is Ed Mitchell. And, he, and it's not him stepping out onto the surface for the first time. It's, um, they have to set up an S-band antenna, uh, which would give a better signal uh, back to Earth of the radio and the TV. And uh, after they set up the S-band antenna, Mitchell climbed back into the uh, lunar module, pushed in the circuit breaker to turn it on, and then he climbed back down. And that movie is from that uh, picture. Now, as you can see, this is a television picture. The television wasn't very good. It was um, color TV on the moon, which when I watched it, I was in grade 10 when this all happened. Uh, I was thrilled because, you know, oh, it's a color, it's on the moon. So anyway, here's a little bit of a video uh, where you can see them deploying the S-band antenna. And then you see the TV picture of Mucho coming down and then I'm gonna have the movie there. And there you see Shepard who took the movie moving into the frame of the TV camera. Okay, what do we got? Now, um, they had a, a little hand cart on the uh, surface with them and then they called it the MET or the Modular Equipment Transport. Now, uh, this is a, a frame grab I, I took from uh, the TV transmission and Shepard has just said, uh, Houston, as you can see, we have just deployed the MET. And uh, the Capcom says, Roger, and he's kind of has a questioning thing in his Met because the picture is so bad. You, the Met is right here. It's it's hard to make out, and it's even hard to make out the As, uh, Al Shepard standing here. Uh, the only thing that shows up really clear is the flag, the S-band antenna, and the limb behind them. But um, the the camera, the color camera, the Westinghouse color camera uh, that they used on this flight uh, really didn't handle the the uh, lighting differences very well. So here's a, another uh, frame grab from the television transmission and you can see the Met standing there. This is when they moved over to uh, load it up with the uh, Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, which was kept in a, in a bay on the, on the, uh, in the limb. And there's Ed Mitchell overexposed in his white suit. 
when they were deploying the, uh, oh, okay, this is what the Met looks, actually looks like. So that's, that's a good picture. You can see it, uh, once they had it all loaded up, it has two wheels, it's got a, a handle. They could mount a camera on it. They could carry their shovels and sample bags and all sorts of stuff, uh, court, excuse me, core tubes, et cetera. Now, when they were setting up the, uh, uh, the experiment package on the first EBA, this is what you saw. <laughs> you just saw these two white blobs off in the distance uh, with putting little other little white blobs uh, on the surface of the moon. The, the picture really wasn't very good unless um, they're really close to the camera and then you can make out some detail. But uh, uh, that was corrected on the next flight. They used a, an RCA camera and it was a, a lot better. So this is another video. This is when they go off to Cohen Crater. And um, um, I remember staying up late. This always, always seems to happen in the middle of the night, these things, uh, watching this. You can see they're very careful not to point it at the sun because they wouldn't didn't want to burn out the camera like they did on Apollo 12. So we saw Al heading off. Whoop. Oh dear. Uh, sorry. Fix it in editing. And this is pretty much all you saw once they went out of uh, the frame for about two and a half, three hours. Well, the networks couldn't just show that. So what they did is they would have two guys tromping around in suits in a simulated uh, moonscape. Now this is from Apollo 15. I couldn't find anything for Apollo 14, but you watch this, they would listen to the transmission. These two guys would try and act out what uh, they were doing. Now I put this in because to show the difference in the sun angle, uh, this this one here is when they, well, you know, I can't stop it. Um, anyway, um, you could see um, the, uh, the glare of the sun uh, when they left is different than when they came back uh, a few hours later uh, because uh, the sun had risen a little bit on the moon. Okay, now up at Cone Crater, this is a, uh, a map from the, uh, or a picture from the uh, um, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter of the Apollo 14 landing site. And so you can see um, the descent stage of Antares down there, the LSEP. You can see the, pat the tracks the astronauts made. And you can also make out some tracks uh, heading up toward Cone Crater. Now the idea, uh, what they wanted to do is get right up to the rim of Cone Crater and, and pick up some samples of rock uh, ejected from, from the crater itself. Um, and they also wanted to roll a rock down into the crater and see what it would do. Uh, but uh, pulling uh, the, the, the terrain uh, turned out to be a lot more hummocky than what they thought. Um, Every time they thought they were getting close to the crater, they would go over a rise thinking, well, we're at the crater and no, no, there's, there's more. And then there's another rise beyond. And so they would go on and they were getting very tired. They were breathing quite heavily. And uh, mission control finally said, you know what guys, uh, we think you're close enough, take some samples and um, we'll say that you got to the rim. So they never actually got to the rim of Cone Crater they got really close and it turned out when they started looking at pictures when they got back to earth, this is where they stopped this rock, uh, which they called saddle rock because well, it looks kind of like a saddle. That's as far as they got. And um, there's saddle rock right there. 
So they got really close to the edge. If they had gone, you know, a few meters further, uh, they would have reached the edge of the crater. They were right there, but uh, uh, mission safety said, no, you've gone far enough. You get your, your heart rates are, are too high. You're breathing too much. You're using up too many consumables. Head back down uh, because the trip down uh, would be a lot easier than the trip up. So that's, uh, that's the trip to Cone Crater. Oh, there's Saddle Rock right there. Right. Now, Apollo 14 probably had uh, the best lunar takeoff sequence uh, because the flag was part, uh, was uh, right outside the window of the limb. So when they uh, lit the engine, it, uh, it was quite dramatic. And also, uh, as part of this video, is uh, one other thing that Al Shepard did just before the end of the EVA. He, uh, he took out a, an improvised golf club and uh, hit three golf balls. So I've got that video. So it's the longest uh, uh, trip, longest golf trip uh, in human history. Uh, so I've got that on the video and I also have a, a reenactment from the uh, HBO miniseries uh, From the Earth to the Moon, which I, I throw in for fun. So here we go. Uh, the guy that played Al Shepard in that miniseries is uh, more noted for playing Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. So he went from serial killer to astronaut. So that's about it. Um, Heavens Above is a great source uh, for all sorts of astronomy uh, information. Uh, what's up in the sky, um, future events, uh, satellite passes, including the ISS. We've had a good series of ISS passes uh, this past 10 days or so. The last one is actually, I think, uh, on the 5th. Uh, and I guess that's about it. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, are there any questions? 
Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll make uh, more of a comment than a question. Just interesting to see the the Luna um, uh, uh, it, um, airbag delivery thing that they used for the Mars rovers decades later. Yeah, yeah. It's just sort of somebody said that's a good idea. <laughs> but I, you know, and the, the out, you know, the folding out pedals. I guess there's a certain amount of convergent evolution once you decide that you're going to do something like that the design ends up coming to much of the same thing mm -hmm. yeah well it's it's whatever works right i mean why why invent something why invent the wheel <laughs> reinvent the wheel any other questions comments raspberries anything <laughs> it was interesting when the lunar lander lander took off and you could see the flag falling down or being what, blown yeah it was being blown it didn't actually fall down they um on apollo 11 it actually did fall down buzz buzz aldrin saw it fall down as they took off but they had no idea the surface was so hard uh so they just had a, a pole and they just kind of jammed it into the uh ground and uh it almost fell down while they were still out on the surface, but uh, it didn't, but it did fall down. After that, um, the uh, pole became a two-part uh, affair with a, a spiked end. So they would hammer down the bottom section and then put the top part with the flag into it. So it would stay up. Yeah. Okay. I, I was going to say like it blew down, but you didn't see any dust clouds. So yeah, the surface must've been quite hard. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, that's one thing in, uh, uh, I know a lot of the moon theory or the moon landing hoax people talk about Stanley Kubrick in 2001, you know, blah, blah, blah. But uh, the, the, the one moon landing that they show is the Aries uh, landing uh, at, uh, at the base and it kicks up this big billowy pile, uh, big billowy dust cloud uh, when it was landing, which wouldn't happen on the moon because there's no air to hold a billowing cloud. It would just get blown out, uh, as you saw in that in that video where uh, when it took off, it, it just blew everything away from the engine. It would not billow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, sorry, my my first time joining. You showed the. Um... Beehive cluster and uh, I forget the name of the other one. In uh, King Cobra, the M67. Yeah. Yeah. What's the best way to find those? Um, you know, being a fairly new new to the hobby. Um, oh, know. get a uh, get a star chart. Uh, I mean, if you go pick up a uh, a copy of Sky News or Astronomy or Sky and Telescope, every month they have a uh, a chart for the sky this month. Now it, it won't be for Edmonton. It'll be more for the middle latitudes of the United States or Toronto for the case of sky news. But uh, you can get your bearings uh, on some more familiar constellations. Like Cancer isn't a very bright constellation, but uh, Leo, which is below it is, you know, you have to go a little later when Leo's fully up in the sky, you can see the big backwards question mark of his head or, or Taurus above it or Gemini, I should say, above it, um, and just get your, the lay of the land and uh, and go have a look. Uh, preferably, you know, because cancer isn't very bright, uh, get away from the... I don't know if I lost my speaker or not. No, we, we can still oh, hear okay. you. If okay. you. Can you pull up Stellarium again? I've got a semi-reasonable way of jumping oh. to it. Oh, okay, yeah, hang on. Uh, well, it's, it's uh, starry night, so let me go back to uh, or yeah, 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 okay, and I'll go to uh, fourth and I will get away from there. We go, okay, swim through the sky. Um, okay, zoom in just. Well, not just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, whoop, okay. B uh, no, back down a bit because uh, um, you need Castor and Pollux. So just drag it down slightly. There you go. 
Okay, so um, maybe uh, can you get rid of the the um, constellation lines? Yeah. They're kind of obscuring the brighter stars. Right. Okay. There we go. Boom. There we go. Okay. So um, I mean, you're starting off the big frame of references in winter is Orion itself. So the 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 belt star and Betelgeuse at the uh, to the upper left there, and then straight left. There's a pair of bright stars, Castor and Pollux. And then down below is uh, Procyon. Just there it is, that guy. Now, if you, t if you make a, a perfect three-sided equilateral triangle, you end up very close to the beehive cluster. So uh, down towards the, so take those as your two of your vertices of your triangle and go yeah, uh, left on your uh, mouse there, just right there. And so you can see it almost makes a perfect three-sided equilateral triangle, but not quite. And in binoculars, that'll be enough to get you to uh, uh, seeing the, the little cloud. And, and even in the city, um, the, uh, the beehive will, will have little sparkly faint sparkles on it. So th that's how I've always found it is an almost perfect equilateral triangle using Procyon and Castor and Pollux. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? The the uh, the joke uh, we we always like to to say was uh, hey those three stars they form a triangle. <laughs> well, as long as they don't form a square. Oh, I have a chat. Hang on here. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Oh, and she's left. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, our next session will be on uh the third oh yeah because february 28 yeah it's gonna be in the third again yeah Duh. okay yeah february 3rd or march 3rd march 3rd okay uh thanks very much and we'll see you later